Hello everyone, it's Sandra and Landon at our new home. This is my tumbleweed stacking system. I call the layers Itsy Bitsy, Teeny and Weeny. We are on Bitsy and I'm just cleaning a worm off the side of Bitsy's wall here. As I just go through this system, I'm going to be talking to you about the worm science of bedding depth today. The research I consulted dealt with Icinia fetida, which are most of my worms here. Although I do have, I think, some, still some blues and some of my Vancouver Island worms now on the mainland, just south of Vancouver. So one of the studies I consulted, and I'll put a screenshot of it up right now, and there'll be a link to it in the description. It talked that uh, bedding depth, which the research calls substrate depth, it's going to influence the physical, chemical, and biological conditions within a vermicomposting system. These, in turn, are going to affect things like aeration and moisture retention and also the worm's access to the food resources. You can see in Bitsy here, I just used some lovely organic matter, some hydrangea heads, some, or, some shredded leaves. Uh, and I didn't specifically put food in this level before we left Victoria, but there would have been some food juices dripped down from the level above that has kick-started these leaves and attracted worms. I can see quite a few worms in this system. Because I'm talking about the worm science of bedding depth, this tray, the Bitsy, has a depth of probably about seven centimeters or probably just about three inches. So actually it's not very deep at all. And there seems to be plentiful worms at this level. Because we're now settled in our new home, I'll just get this vine out of the way. I'm going to start treating at least itsy and bitsy like regular worm bins and give them each a feeding while we talk about the science behind bedding depth. As you know, Icinia fetida, the red wiggler worms, are an epigeic worm, meaning that they re reside in the upper layers of organic matter. Now, out in the wild, this would be things like leaf litter and manure, you know, even compost piles. Now, they don't burrow down into the mineral soil. Those are for other types of earthworms, but they do make burrows, as I've talked about in previous worm science uh, research, inside the bins themselves. Now, as worm farmers, we take worms, these red wiggler worms, out of a wild condition, and we put them in these container systems so we actually can control the depth of the system, which is interesting to look at the research to say, well, what do the worms actually prefer? This vine is really starting to bug me. I actually think it's starting to grow. I can see some shoots on it here. Um, there's no way the worms are gonna eat it while that vine is still alive. I'll bury it, but I'm pretty sure I'll keep finding it until it finally dies. So you can see that I'm still well below the struts on the edge of this bin that show the maximum depth this layer can have. I just added some eggshell grit on the top and now we go up to Itsy. The research cautioned that the deeper the substrate, the more it's going to retain moisture and a deeper bed could potentially become waterlogged. A waterlogged bin is going to greatly reduce aeration and a lack of aeration is going to greatly reduce reproduction. Now I'm using this stacking system basically as a transportation method to bring over this coconut coir that I added here at this top level, um, mixed up with a little bit of cardboard and some shredded leaves. So this is not how the bin will be finally up and running, but you can see that the depth of this level is at least 15 to 20 centimeters or about six to eight inches. The research notes that when you get bedding depths of about that, the bedding is going to be less susceptible to swings in temperature. In the summer conditions, that means this bin is going to be more resilient when temperatures heat up. Thought I might find some worms in these avocado shells. Nope. A nice stable temperature is also going to be conducive to increased reproduction. Interestingly, the researchers said that increased depth may negatively affect decomposition of these organic materials because of the lack of aeration that I already mentioned. So just like worms need oxygen, and I'll put a link in the description, a screenshot here of the worm science video I did 
on worms and oxygen consumption. So just like the worms need oxygen, so do the microbes and the bin critters uh, that are responsible for breaking down and decomposing the organic material so worms can get into it. If a bin is not sufficiently aerated, those deep layers of bedding will contain less oxygen and so the decomposition will be greatly slowed. Now, if you're a research junkie like me, you know that research is never definitive and no one study ever gives you complete answers. And sometimes research gives you slightly contradictory answers. And if you looked at my last uh, worm science video on feeding, frequency, and distribution, it said that shallow bedding depths of approximately five to six centimeters or about two to two and a half inches supported significant cocoon production. That suggests that Icinia fetida can reproduce effectively in confined shallow substrates. There's some cocoons in this bin building up. So anyway, those shallow substrates, um, the reason that reproduction was shown to be so high, the researchers speculated was likely due to the improved aeration. You know, there's not much depth for that oxygen uh, deprivation to occur and food availabilities, as long as the moisture is regulated, the substrate is not allowed to dry out. And there's more cocoons here. So, but what I looked at for this research, more specifically looking at uh, vermicomposting, um, the dynamics of deep bedding systems, found that Icinia fetida, the red wigglers, actually preferred a substrate depth of exactly what this top level itsy is, about 15 to 20 centimeters or six to eight inches. That's if the feeding is put at a depth of about 15 centimeters, so almost all the way to the bottom of this bin. So that, the researchers found, allowed for optimal aeration and the access to the organic matter. Cocoon hatching rates were highest at 15 centimeters. And again, this is likely due to stable moisture and temperature conditions. You may be familiar with Rhonda Sherman, who is with North Carolina State University and has written and presented extensively on composting worms. I'll put a screenshot of her seminal work here on the screen. Well, the North Carolina State Extension put out a publication that confirmed what this research found and that is that even in bedding systems that go as deep as 18 inches, like you might find in a wedge system or a continuous flow system, they found that the ideal breeding and hatching zone is 15 to 20 centimeters, or that's six to eight inches. You'll notice I've put the feeding zone right down the bottom of the level of itsy here. And I've just dumped out a baiting container that I put in my castings tote. I'm just looking to see how many worms took the bait. Uh, this was only baiting uh, for four days. So there are worms in here, but I'll have to replace uh, the bait cup or maybe use the different bait cup next time around and get some more worms. There's still food in here. Uh, this was some cornmeal and some coffee grounds and some veggie juices in this bait cup. I All I've got to add to this level for food is I've got some frozen, previously frozen uh, banana scraps, banana peel, and they are hand cut up because we cannot find our food processor. No matter, I'm sure the worms will do just fine with this feeding. Okay, so now my takeaways. Well, the good news is if you're like me and your bedding tends to build up on you before you get around to doing a harvest, the research supports that. 15 to 20 centimeters, six to eight inches is just fine for the worms. They actually prefer it and they will have more reproductive success due to better moisture, temperature, and nutrient availability. Aeration is key. So don't let your bedding depth build up too deep without fluffing. And if you're like me again, you love to fluff your worms. I gotta bury this baiting container because I think there might be wisps still on the inside. I forgot to mention that juveniles actually prefer it slightly shallower, four to six inches, 10 to 15 centimeters. 
probably due to their increased rate of oxygen consumption, closer to the top of the bin, more oxygen. So we heard the term epigea worms and we say they're shallow dwellers, but shallow according to this research is six to eight inches for optimum reproduction. All right, everyone, that's it for me and bye from Itzy. Thanks for watching.